Good morning, everyone. The clock has struck 10. That means we are going to begin. Uh, my name is Samantha McCoy. I'm the service coordinator today, and I'm also 
currently serving as the chair of our Sunday services ministry team. And I've been a member here for about 20 years now. Um, consider this my religious home. Um, before we officially start the service, um, let's take a few moments to greet each other. Say hello to those around you, wave across the room. We can wave to the friends on camera. Welcome again to the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Danbury, where we have been gathering in one form or another for a little over 200 years now, which is always exciting to think about. Um, if you haven't done so already and you have one of these electronic devices in your pocket, now is a great time to silence it so that we can be attentive to where we are here in the service. Uh, as we begin, we also want to respectfully acknowledge that our buildings and our property here on Clapford Ridge Road are located on the traditional land of the Pogasset people. In terms of our announcements for today, um, first I want to um, draw your attention or give, give a welcome to our speaker today, who's Tom Krattenmaker. He's sitting over there to the side. You will hear from him shortly. Um, Tom is an author and columnist who focuses on the connections between religion and values and public life. And I think you're really going to enjoy his message today. He was with us a little over a year ago, and we're very happy to have him back again. I'll also point out that next week, Reverend Tony is back with us, and his service is titled pebs and bristol bucks where he will be reflecting on poverty debt late stage capitalism and hopeful economic alternatives so that sounds fascinating and we will look forward to that next week uh, my other announcement well I've, i have multiple announcements so you're going to have to bear with me this is this is a busy time at uucd and it's all wonderful stuff um, if we look two weeks ahead uh, to february 18th you may notice that there's an insert in your order of service it looks like this and we are so so lucky this this came together quickly after a lot of work by todd zagoric to get um shorin say it again wapatuque piper who is the clan mother of the golden hill pagussets she's going to come here on the 18th and speak to us and we're so looking forward to that service um, but you can see that our friends who are um, organizing that service are looking for a little feedback and interest and what want to know what you want to hear what questions do you have so we'd love to have you reply to that note in the order of service. The other thing that's happening, which is also for next week, um, is that our friends in religious education have a fundraiser they're going to be doing, and they've been planning this for several weeks, and it's supporting Heifer International. Um, this is their pre-Valentine's Day fundraiser to raise money to buy farm animals through Heifer to share with families who need them. This is going to happen next week during the coffee hour. So we hope that you'll remember to bring your checkbook or bring some cash. Um, and there's a variety of, of ways Heifer helps people. Um, you know, for instance, a $20 donation can get a flock of chicks to a family. $30 can get a hive of bees. $60 seeds a garden. All the way up to $275 can send a young woman to school. So there's so many ways to contribute and the kids in RE are looking forward to that fundraiser. So we hope that you'll be ready and looking forward to it as well. And my final thing I think is that um, next week is also uh, music at the Ridge and um, the, we have a, a little spotlight video for our performer and I neglected to get that name ready. Nancy, tell me her name. Louis, Louis Collins. So um, let's let's listen to a little bit, give you a taste of that music, and hopefully you'll be around next week to participate in the concert. Hi, I'm Louis Collins. 
I am really excited that I get to come and sing for you at Music at the Ridge on um, Sunday the 11th. So I want to just give you a little taste of what I will be singing for you that day. This is a song by my friend Peter Mayer from the Midwest. If you're stressed and get depressed with politics and traffic jams and Google News has frightened you and CNN has made you mad and talk of the environment has left you spent and pessimistic for the future, just remember that lurking at your feet there is enchantment underneath the ground. Forces that have brought you here are wielding all their powers now, the air, the sun, the and the soil are conspiring and magic things are happening when it gets dark in your heart with the world in all its worries well you just might find a little light if you start to make a little garden in your little backyard so it's just a little snippet, but just to give you a taste, um, I will have, I'm so excited about this, I will have Anand Nayak with me, who is my absolute favorite musician to collaborate with. He will be playing guitar, he's an extraordinary guitar player, and he sings the most beautiful. Okay. To, to be continued, you will find out when you come next week. It's perfect. It's a little bit of a cliffhanger. It's excellent. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Excellent. For, for those who are interested in getting both events on their calendar next Sunday, it is possible. That's a great point, Nancy. Um, so once again, welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Danbury. I neglected to say this at the opening, but if you are new to us this week, uh, we would love it if you stayed for coffee hour to say hello and meet some of us. We also have welcome materials in the foyer by where you came in, so we hope you'll take a look at those as well. We are one people of many backgrounds, beliefs, political identities, sexual orientations, and genders. We believe that everyone is welcome here and everyone is loved. So let's get our service moving with the chalice lighting affirmation. Please join me in the words as you see them in your order of service and up on the screen. Love is the spirit of this congregation and justice is its light. This is our covenant, to dwell together in peace, to seek and speak the truth in love, to help one another and celebrate life. And now please rise, embody your spirit. We're going to sing hymn number 1007 from the Teal Hymnal, There's a River Flowing in My Soul.
It is just so good to be together. Yes. Let's say our children's affirmation. The words are on the screen. We are Unitarian Universalists. We are people with open minds, loving hearts, and helping hands. We care for the earth and each other. And today's story actually comes by video, so we'll get that video ready. <coughs> the story's title is The Everything Seed. The Everything Seed, a story of beginnings by Carol Martignaco, illustrated by Joy Troyer. Have you ever watched a seed grow? Have you ever noticed how it begins, so small, so still, so quiet, like a gift wanting to be opened? And how slowly it wakes up, begins to unfold, growing into something larger and larger and larger? Then you know that whatever comes from a seed usually ends up looking very little like the seed it came from, which is also true of the very first seed. Once, long, long ago, way back before the beginning, so long ago there was no such thing as time because there was no one there to count it. Everywhere was a huge, deep, mysterious place, like something waiting to happen. There were no stars, no sun or moon. There was no place like Earth, not a drop of water or a single tree or a rock or flower and no living beings anywhere. But in that deep waiting space was hidden the tiniest point of something no bigger than a seed. It was not a flower seed. It was not an elm tree seed. It was not a seed of corn, although all of those things were included in the seed. You might call it an everything seed, because that is what it became. No one knows where that first seed came from, or how it was planted, or how it knew in the way that only seeds seem to know how long to wait for just the right moment to sprout and grow. But all at once, this tiny seed, cradled and nourished in the rich soil of space, woke up, broke open, and began to unfold, unfolding, unfolding, and blossoming forth into an enormous, blazing ball of bright light like a great grandmother sun. And the universe was born. Out fluttered the galaxies like a storm of snowflakes swirling and gathering into the brightest, most blindingly beautiful cloud of stars. And out of those star clouds whirled our very own star, the one we call the sun and our Earth, and the Moon, and all the round spinning planets we have learned how to name. And this is the secret of that tiny seed. You and I were there in the very beginning. Just as the idea for each leaf on a big oak tree lies hidden inside an acorn. <coughs> We were there with all the stars and planets, all the rocks and oceans, plants and animals and people. Everything that is now, ever was, or ever will be was inside that first tiny seed. So whenever you hold a seed in your hand and wonder what it could become, imagine how you and all that is here once came from the tiniest speck of an everything seed before it sprouted and grew long, long ago in the way back beginning of time. 
Now, if this were an ordinary story, it would end right here. But this story of the universe keeps unfolding. What once began in a blazing blossom of light continues every day. New stars sprout open in the deep soil of space. New plants and animals appear on the earth. Seeds of many kinds are scattered everywhere. To help us remember. And new people are born every day with the spark of that first light still alive and burning deep inside, waiting. Like the everything seed, to shine in ways that are yet to be known. I want to invite all people who are interested in coming down to our children's programming um, with the volunteers and myself to come downstairs now. And we're going to meet in the large room all together because we're going to do things just a little bit differently today. So please meet me there when we get downstairs. And we'll sing this little light of mine together. <laughs> Like Sierra Marie said a few minutes ago, it is so, so good to be together. And part of what brings us together or part of what makes it good being together is that we can share what's on our minds and in our hearts. So this is our time of um, for milestones. We do them in two different ways. We'll begin with silent milestones. Jerry will play some quiet music. You're welcome to come up and put a stone in the bowl. If you're at home watching on Zoom and you have a silent milestone, you're not ready to type out feel free to put an X or another marker in the chat. When we finish silent milestones, we'll move on to spoken. It's for silent reflection. So I encourage you to settle in your seat, maybe focus on your breathing for a moment. I will ring the singing bowl to get us started. And uh, then Jerry, after a bit, will take us into spirit of life.
Good morning. Thanks for inviting me to your church again. This reading comes from the author and essayist and poet Maria Popova of the Marginalian. We were never promised any of it, this world of cottonwoods and clouds, when the Big Bang set the possible in motion. And yet, here we are, atoms with consciousness, each of us a living improbability forged of chaos and dead stars. Children of chance, we have made ourselves into what we are, creatures who can see a universe of beauty in the feather of a bird. This is the time in our service for our offering. And because it is the first Sunday of the month, we're trying to get back into our share the plate habits. So uh, we, this month, are partnering with an organization called the Jericho Partnership. And Lisa Sidlecki is here to speak to us about their work. Uh, and whatever donations we receive today will be split 50-50 between UUCD and the Jericho Partnership. Good morning. It is great to be here. What a welcoming congregation. You feel it the minute you walk in as soon as you find the door, right? So it's awesome. Um, yeah, so uh, my name is Lisa Sidlecki. I'm the co-executive director of Jericho Partnership. Our mission is to serve the um, academic, physical, social, and spiritual needs of Danbury's at-risk youth. Am I getting closer? Um, so uh, we do that in a number of ways. We, uh, we basically do uh, mentoring, uh, tutoring, um, healthcare, and services, right? So when I looked at the, this congregation and what it stands for, the tenets of, of love and peace and justice, uh, we align, right? We align perfectly with that. We were talking about how love is an, is an action. Um, it's not just a feeling, right? So we actually, we what we do um, hopes to show the kids in our care that they're loved, that we love them, um, that they can rise above their circumstances because most of them come from um, poverty for sure, unstable households for sure, um, challenges and obstacles that, um, you know, you know, you know what they are, right? Um, drugs and, and crime and, and a bunch of different things. Um, so, you know, the what we do every day is intended to show love and spur them into some sort of like a life transformational situation where they can rise above their circumstances, understand their potential and who they are, who they were created to be, and then live a life of excellence, whatever that looks like for them, right? Um, justice, you got, you know, your tenets of love, peace, and justice, right? Justice is exactly what we, we're in existence to sort of look at kids that are underserved, right? Who have obstacles that they face all the time. Um, and, and help them see beyond those things and move beyond those things. You know, we have kids who come in, it's an academic program entirely, and they come in and imagine if they can't, if they, if they don't get math, right? And they think, I'll never get math. Um, um, you know, no one, no one cares about me to teach me math. No one cares about me, period. So they're going to fail math because they think they're going to fail math. But they come in, we have tutors who come alongside them, help them understand they can do math because, you know, they're bright. They've just never been, like, allowed to shine, right? So they come in and we have tutors who come alongside. They'll learn math. They'll go to school the next day, get an A on their math quiz. And all of a sudden, this life is like this. They see their own potential for the first time. So that's one of the things that we do all the time. Um, you know, let's see, we have 344 kids in our program last year, so it's a, it's a big footprint. Um, we have another uh, 800 plus who are served by our pediatric clinic in Danbury. Samaritan Health Center is our partner organization. Um, we serve 400 plus families every month through our food pantry. Um, and we also distribute through the public schools um, 800 what we call weekender bags every month. And what those look like are bags that have six simple meals because we have been told through the public schools that there are kids 
who aren't eating on the weekends because their parents are either working or unable. Or that program started with 30 bags uh, about a year and a half ago per week. Now we're doing 800 a month through six Danbury public schools plus our own program. So the need is out there. Um, we're serving, you know, like I said, thousands of people. If we count the kids that we serve in our programs, the ones that we serve through our food pantry, the, the 600 kids through the weekend or bag programs, 800 plus kids through the pediatric clinic. Jericho Partnerships footprint in Danbury is over 4,000 people that we're serving. If you count parents, right? You have to count parents because if you have a sick kid, anybody in here who's a parent knows that they have a sick kid, but they don't have health insurance. They have nowhere to go but there's a place for them to go. Like that parent has been served. That parent has been shown love. That parent has been shown compassion. So, so the same thing goes, uh, goes through there. So um, yeah, that's our program. Um, we, re we rely on the support of um, individual volunteers, donors, um, people to support us. And um, yeah, just thank you so much for having us here. Um, I'll hang around at the end to answer any questions that you might have, but Again, thanks for uh, thanks for your support. Thank you, Lisa. It helps to know more about the organization we're partnering with. So we are a generous congregation, and this is the moment where we show our generosity for our programs, our staff, our facilities, as well as this week, our partners um, with the Jericho Partnership. Uh, there are many ways to give. The link will be in the chat if you are online. There is the QR code on the screen. You can put cash or a check in the plate as it passes here in the fellowship hall. You can also mail a check to us here at 24 Clapboard Ridge Road. If you are visiting us for the first time, please don't feel obligated to give because your presence is your gift to us today. So with all of that in mind, we'll gratefully receive this week's offering.
If you're like me, you've been hearing it for years, but haven't known quite what to do with it. The idea that we're made of stardust or star stuff, as Carl Sagan famously put it. There's no doubting the truth of it. The fact that debris from exploding stars littered the earth with ingredients that would combine and coalesce and conspire to create life. But so what? Cool idea, not sure how it applies to anything. So I've thought, my focus quickly jumping to pressing matters like work and bills and last night's pro basketball scores. You know what? I'm starting to realize that the stardust thing is a pressing matter. Maybe the most pressing matter of all. Something to build our values and lives around. It's what the world needs now. You could call this the revelation I've had, a gradual revelation at the hands of the activists and writers and thinkers I've spoken with and the podcasts I've listened to and the books and articles I've read, now an online course, all helping me see the amazingness of the story of the universe and its meaning for our lives. So I'd like to briefly convey the essence of these learnings with you in the hope that they'll be valuable to you as they've been for me. Now, when it comes to transmitting knowledge and wisdom, people tend to think that it flows from older people to younger people. Well, it doesn't always work out that way. And personally, I am glad that I am allowed to learn from people who are younger than I am. Much of what I've learned about the story of the universe and its meaning is from, is from somebody who is 30 years my junior. Sam, not this Sam, although she's awesome too. The Sam that I've been learning from is an environmental educator an activist and speaker and podcast host I've gotten to know. He has given up obvious and attractive career paths to live as though the stardust thing means everything. He's devoted his life to being a champion of the new cosmology and its applications. He and others like him and Sam does see an encouraging growth in their ranks. Well, they model a kind of life beyond traditional religion that finds meaning and inspiration, an ethical foundation through deep engagement with the story of the universe and the life that it spawned. I've learned so much by listening to Sam, taking cues from what he does, gobbling up the articles and the podcasts he recommends to me. Let me quote Sam as he explains his vocation or his calling, if you prefer. He says, quote, I am teaching the story of the universe um, in, an inter in an integral manner and working with young people to help them become hopeful agents in creating a regenerative human presence on our planet at a time of unprecedented crisis and opportunity. I am interested in worldview transformation and action born out of what Thomas Berry called an ecozoic consciousness. Still quoting Sam, what are the implications for the way we teach, practice spirituality and structure society? End quote. Excuse me. I always need at least one drink, Sam. Mm -hmm. Thanks for having that there. Well, that is an excellent question that Sam asks. What are the implications of this story for the way that we teach and practice spirituality and so on? Well, here are some of the major ones. We need to change the way young people are educated. In many schools today, students, uh, students tend to be shuttled from fragmented subject to fragmented subject without being adequately taught how these subjects relate to one another and to the origins and predicaments of life on earth. And without science being imbued with the sense of wonder and excitement that it deserves. So there's one, we need to change legal systems, which are predicated on the false idea that the rights of humans are the only rights that truly matter. That it's somehow acceptable to damage and destroy the more than human world. 
We need to transform our relationship with the earth from exploitation to regeneration, giving back to it as much as or more than we take from it. We need to create and enact rituals that can embed the origin story in our psyches, making it more than a cool idea. Sam, for instance, takes people on something called the cosmic walk. Have any of you done a cosmic walk? I'm doing it for the first time later this month. At these walks, participants travel along a 138 foot rope, each foot representing 100 million years. As your quick math just told you, the 138 feet together represent the 13.8 billion years that have unfolded since the Big Bang. There is much, much more, but what it comes down to is the leap from knowing to caring. Caring about the amazingness of the universe and the life it spawned. Caring enough to go from nodding at the reality of climate change to internalizing the chilling truth about what it threatens to do, what it is doing now to life on Earth. Caring enough to make the changes that are needed to prevent the worst from happening and to create a future in which all life can thrive. What it comes down to is justice. Justice not only for all types of people, but justice for all living things, justice for the Earth on which all life depends. As I've taken my humanism deeper and deeper into the story of the universe, I've been finding the story fascinating and thrilling really, but more than that, it's making me care. It's making me value human life and all forms of life more than I did before. It's making me see how precious it is. The cosmic story is making me want to do more to protect the planetary home on which all life depends. What we value, of course, forms our values. I asked my friend Sam what values he derives from the story of the universe. He responded by saying that he is, quote, interested, interested in how we live lives that are mutually enhancing and inspire others to live more reciprocally with the earth process, end quote. He cites pollinator gardens, food forests, other forms of food growing by which humans can meet our food needs while being partners in propagating biodiversity. This is a great example of what I mean when I say that serious engagement with the story of the universe is what the world needs now. There's a lot there. There's a lot to learn from the story. A lot we can do with that knowledge that's beneficial to life. And by the way, if you're interested in diving deeper into this subject, there are resources aplenty. I know there are people in this congregation who are knowledgeable and passionate about this subject, so they can help you. There are many great books and films and podcasts and online courses. Google Story of the Universe and you'll be on your way. Or contact me and I'll be happy to point you in the right direction. Our values, when taken seriously, drive our behavior. Now, the exact shape of that behavior, that will vary among those of us who embrace the story of the universe. But the impact goes a long way, from voting and activism to decisions about work and diets and spiritual practices. The products we buy or choose to forego, where we live and myriad other things. The charge is to align ourselves with the story of the universe, to get in sync with the ways and wonders of biological life on Earth. Thomas Berry, the great eco-theologian, summed it up this way many years ago, quote, basic values depend on conformity with the Earth process. To harm the Earth is to harm the human. To ruin the Earth is to destroy humankind. End quote. To the extent that our decisions and actions make us better humans and citizens, and how could they not? Embracing the story of the universe is a good thing, but I contend that it has value beyond that. 
it can provide our culture with something that it urgently needs. You see, humanity is at a painful point in history right now. We're between paradigms, between stories. In the Western world, the old story is largely played out. The story of the monotheistic God that elevated humans above all other forms of life. Now that story met people's needs for a long time, but it fostered an exploitive relationship with our planetary home. It was almost a century and a half ago that Nietzsche declared that God dead. But in many ways, it's only now that those death of God chickens are coming home to roost. What do I mean? Well, in recent decades, the Western world has seen a dramatic increase in the numbers of people living life without traditional religion. In our country, even many of the most fervent proclaimers of God belief frequently behave as though they don't really believe their deity is real. So that's what I say when the old story is starting to play itself out and move on and that we're moving on. But this old paradigm is going out, not with a whimper, but with a snarl. This we can see mainly in the hostile politics associated with segments of the population most invested in the old story and its hierarchies. A sense of dislocation and pessimism pervades society, a sense of anxiety. The culture in many ways seems to have lost its bearings. We need a new story, a story that answers the questions of our time, that makes sense of our existence, that provides, that provides context, provides psychological and emotional mooring for this mysterious thing called life. The author David Christian addresses this in his book, Origin Story, A Big History of Everything. So there's a resource for you. Christian writes, quote, how did we get here? Our modern origin story, and he's referring to the story of the universe, it can help us get our bearings by placing human history within the much larger story of planet Earth and the universe, end quote. Christian calls this view the view from the mountaintop. And from this mountaintop, we can see some hugely significant shifts happening. As alluded to before, a more secular world is setting in alongside evolving forms of religion suited to the unique threats and challenges of our time, and that's a good thing. We can see a gradual shift in the zeitgeist, an awakening to the urgent need to protect our one and only planetary home. And this change bodes well for you, yous and humanists like you and me, and for the kind of world we envision. But to fulfill its potential and exert a constructive potency, this evolution in human history needs a story, a story that can sell it, that can give a good response to the big questions that have captivated human imaginations and animated conversations since the first campfires. This story of the universe, well, it has the answers in my view. Its characters and plot lines aren't deities or tales of the supernatural. Its source material is found in the natural world and our scientific understanding of it. What we can see with the naked eye as we marvel at the mountains or the ocean or the night sky. What we can see through ever more powerful telescopes and microscopes. This is not dry, dispassionate science. This is science brought to life. This is the spellbinding story that science can tell when it's given the chance. It's a story that they didn't know in Nietzsche's time. Thanks to science, we know it now. We know the story, the Big Bang, the simple elements of an expanding young universe combining in ever more interesting, complex ways, following decipherable and consistent laws of physics, 
forming stars, then planets, including Earth, which in its own fascinating ways, with its just right Goldilocks conditions, birthed chemical interactions, creating life in its mind-boggling complexity and grandeur. If you take a step back and behold it, it's jaw-dropping. To use the word in a colloquial sense, it's miraculous. Going back to the Maria Popova reading that we heard a little while ago, she is right that we never were promised any of this when the Big Bang set the possible in motion. Yet here we are, atoms with consciousness, each of us a living improbability, forged of dead stars, creatures who can see the universe of beauty in the feather of a bird. So there you have it. That's the story. It's pretty simple. We come from the universe. We are of the earth. That's the story that we are compelled to tell and continue. The story we need to live by. Once we know the story, like really know it in our bones, it seems to me our only course of action is to strive, to strive with all of our effort and heart to be worthy of it. Please join us for our hymn of celebration. It's number 1064 in the Teal Hymnal, Blue Boat Home. Rise, embody your spirit as you are moved. In a moment, Tom will come up and offer some closing words. We'll hear the postlude, and we hope many of you will stay for conversation and coffee after the service. But for now, please join me in the words for extinguishing our chalice. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, or the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. We 
These we carry in our hearts and out into the world until we are together again. Today's closing words are from Loyal Rue. If ever there were a candidate for a universal story, it must be this story of cosmic evolution. This story shows us in the deepest possible sense that we are all siblings, fashioned from the same stellar dust, energized by the same star, nourished by the same planet, endowed with the same genetic code, and threatened by the same evils. This story, more than any other story, humbles us before the magnitude and complexity of creation. Like no other story, it bewilders us with the improbability of our existence, astonishes us with the interdependence of all things, and makes us feel grateful for the lives we have. And not least of all, it inspires us to express our gratitude to the past by accepting a solemn and collective responsibility for the future.